Hi, I'm Amy Maracle from MindfulArtStudio.com and I'm talking today with Connie Solera from Dirty Footprints Studio and I just want to welcome you. Yay, thank you. <laughs> thanks, so much for, <laughs> thanks so much for being here and um, in case anyone doesn't know you, I'll just say that um, Connie teaches painting and art journaling both online and in amazing remote locations like in Mexico, it's Oaxaca, am I right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and, um, you probably also know her from the 21 secrets class, or perhaps you've taken painting the feminine, or you're interested in her ignite, um, creative business coaching classes. There's lots of places to find Connie everywhere. Um, yeah. so welcome. Thanks so much for Thanks. being here. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for inviting me. I yeah. love it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, you know, this is actually the first time we're, I mean, you know, this is not like in person, but kind of meeting. We've had a lot yeah. of email exchanges, but it's the first time we're getting a chance to chat. So it's a nice reason to have an excuse to chat, actually. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And you were one of my beloved 21 Secrets teachers as well. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. And I really appreciated being able to do that. I had a great time with it. Yeah. Beautiful. Nice. So... The reason that I specifically wanted to talk to you for this interview, well, there's there's a few different reasons, but what sparked it for me was, um, you know, your emails talking about your decision to um, move to Costa Rica, uh -huh. and I so your email really resonated with me. I was thinking, like, I mean, obviously your your husband is from Costa Rica, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, that yeah. makes it a little bit less of a leap, but still, <laughs> it's a pretty huge mm -hmm. leap, and so. I was just thinking about, you know, I'm sure this is true for your folks too, but I know with my students, it's just this constant fight against between what our kind of inner impulses want and need and what I would say the inner critic tries to say in terms of the art or just kind of our general fears or art fears get in the way. And I feel like you... I'm getting to my point here. <laughs> oh, you're doing wonderful. I feel like you've done such a nice job of modeling with this decision for all of us what it looks like when you follow your heart. And I've basically built my whole life up until now on following my heart in one way or another. Um, I've been an artist my entire life. Like, this is all I've ever wanted and known and I was lucky when I was a kid to uh, be a part of a family that supported it for the most part like mm -hmm. my mom would take me to uh, classes at the, the museum and every Christmas and birthday I just got art supplies and, That's great. and all that and um, and then when I was in high school I was really blessed because I went to a high school where I could major in art so oh, wow get to do that as well and then you know I went to college but something happened in high school and what happened is that my family and my teachers and everyone were like you know this is great that you're doing art and you know taking all these classes but you need to find something to fall back on mm -hmm. like it's really important to find something to fall back on because this is probably not going to work so that's basically the message my mentors my teachers my family would give me and so I spent the majority of my 20s <laughs> following my heart and my art, but constantly, constantly searching for what is this thing I'm going to do to fall back on? Because if this doesn't work, what am I going to do? What am I going to yeah. do? Right? Yeah. And um, so my energy was really dissected for the majority of my early adulthood and 20s. Um, I still made art. I went to art school, and it, when I was in art school, I was there for three and a half years, and something didn't feel right then. Like, something was just not clicking. I loved art. I was on scholarship when I was there. I mean, I was doing really well, but I knew that the traditional academic um, approach to that path as an artist wasn't really for me. And I didn't know what it was. And interestingly, that was around the time when blogging, like this is in the late 90s, just started. And I actually had a blog back then, long, long time ago, um, where I kind of dipped my toes into it and started writing about my art and, and where I lived and, and stuff like that. And um, I think my first real like listening to my heart, knowing that 
my outer circumstances isn't resonating with my inner. Yeah. Was that when I decided to leave art school. And what I did is I, I left, and I knew I was still going to be an artist. I knew I was still going to do art, but I didn't know where I fit. And so I took a year off. I worked. I was already a teacher. I was teaching at the Cleveland Art Museum, and I was teaching and working a million different art jobs and, you know, had a little studio, and I was still painting. And then I decided to go to the university after that and study, um, finish my painting degree and also do an art history degree because I really loved writing. And so I was really immersed in it. And then I realized this isn't really me that I wasn't so into the decorum that comes with art history. I just loved talking about art. And yeah. so, um, but I still kept at it, you know, and I, I received my degree and then I, I kept teaching and I really loved teaching and I taught in the art museum. And so I was like, I need to teach the masses. I need, I need, to, I need to teach everyone. So then I went back to get my art ed, you know, um, degree. Because in the meantime, I was always following what I loved. Like, oh, I love, I love writing and talking about art. So I got that degree. And then I realized, man, that didn't fit, you know. And then I loved teaching, so I went and did that. And then I actually started, I left the museum and started teaching in public schools. And then I realized, nah, this isn't it either, <laughs> you know. But, but I was still, you know, loving it and still doing my art. And it, I, sometimes when I think about it, I was just waiting for the technology to kind of catch up. Yeah. Because um, then at that time, I did start blogging with Dirty Footprints. And that's when blogging was starting to really, you know, when I started in my 20s, it was like, I, there was like 10 people that had a blog, you know, nobody knew about blogs. And then um, when I started Dirty Footprints in 2008, 10 years ago, there was... You know, this is, it was like really juicy. There wasn't much social media. Twitter like just was starting, you know, and nobody like was really on Facebook or anything. So it was, blogs were so juicy. Yeah. So that was like, you know, the perfect, the perfect um, medium for me to start sharing. And um, it was through my blog that then I, I started to find my sweet spot. You know, I really started to find my sweet spot and... Uh, in 2010, I could leave. I left my job and decided to pour everything I had into Dirty Footprints. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think that's so important is because it, it took me, I was like 34, I don't remember how old I was, but it probably took me 15 years of trying to find that thing to fall back on. Right. <laughs> And what I realized is I didn't need anything to fall back on. I just needed to pour all my energy into what I loved, right. you know? And so that's what I was doing. I was like, I'm just going to do what I really love. And once I started doing what I really loved completely, everything really started opening for me. Has it been easy? It's not been easy. Lots of times I'm banging my head against the wall, but there's a different sense of alignment, I feel, than when I was in jobs. There's a different sense of easiness, I feel, than when I was in jobs where I hated, right? right? And, you know, they might have been easier, but it was like, I didn't feel, I didn't have ease yeah. in my life, you know? So I share that because it's kind of in my constitution to always do what I want to do or fall, mm -hmm. even as my poor mom, like, my teenage years was trouble for her because I do what I want to do. I follow what I really want um, to do. And I'm kind of stubborn about that. You know, if I, had, when I was younger, if I had a job and it didn't start to gel with me, I would leave, you know, and I'd find another job. And it always seemed to open as long as I was always following what, what really made me come alive about it. And so then in regards to Costa Rica, the first time I went to Costa Rica is when I met my husband, who was my, wasn't my husband at the time, and we went, so it was almost 20 years ago, and I knew then, immediately, the minute my foot touched the land, I knew, it was like, vroom, hmm. I, was, I need to live here, I'm going to have a studio, I could see it, yeah. and between then and now, there's been two other times that we almost, we came very close to moving, and something tragic or life-changing happened, and we couldn't go. And so um, 
this decision to move has is, is been a long time processing. And we have land there. We have family there. I've gone there a million because I know what I'm stepping into yeah. when I make this decision. It wasn't kind of like, oh. Yeah. You know? um, and it's something that has been guiding me for, the, for a very long time. And a lot of my students, like when I made the kind of official announcement this year, a lot of my students were like, well, finally, because I've been talking about it. For a long time, and I talked about it quite a bit also on my blog, if you go in the archives, you know, this has mm-hmm. been something for a long time to come. And so um, now, I think what differentiates me now from, you know, 20 years ago is that I always still follow my heart, but I I have a, um, a bit more intention to what I'm doing, in a yeah. sense, than than before then, like, oh, I don't like the job, so I'm going to leave, you know, kind of thing. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. (laughs) I kind of forgot (laughs) where we went. No, I I think you are. I mean, I I think, again, I have to be interested in it from the perspective of, uh, you know, I think the the folks who come, I'm guessing Dirty Footprints, too, you know, and the folks who come to Mindful Edge Studio, I think they're attracted to these kinds of conversations that I have, because I'm constantly looking for those intersections between life and art and how you make those decisions Mm -hmm. and how that mindful present approach helps you. And so I'm just kind of curious, how does that weave in for you? Does that weave in for you? Um, Well, for one thing, I have a real so one thing that I've always had really since I was young since I started teaching is I always had kind of a mission in the sense to um kind of a I guess in a spiritual mission in some sense to to what I want to bring when I'm teaching so when I was younger I was like I want to teach the masses it was really believing that art was like everyone should have access to art it's Mm -hmm. just so um healthy and as I've gotten older and as I've gotten deeper into my own practice, actually that mission has gotten narrower and narrower yeah. as I've realized what my real gifts are and what I'm really here to do and how I'm here to serve. And so I'm really clear, um, and in the sense of mindfulness, I'm really clear about what I'm good at and what I'm, what my energy is and what I can give to the world. And so I try not to like splurt it in, in lots of areas in a sense yeah. and stay really kind of channeled in, in that sense. So what can happen though, sometimes because I am an artist is I can get really distracted once in a while. Well, not, it's getting better. It's gotten way better, you know, so I, you can get distracted by like, Oh, I really love that, you know? Yeah. And I re- I want to try that or I want to try this. But, um, I allow myself, you know, just a little bit of that. And then I really come back to my own practice, what's really important to me and keep deepening it. And so, um, I guess that's how I would approach mindfulness in my my own practice the most. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, where you started with that, I think is part of why I connect so much with your work is, is the element that you mentioned about it being spiritual and I don't know what that means for you. I I know that when I look at your work, my experience, I can speak to my experience of your work, and then I'd love to hear your <laughs> experience. Um, so, you know, where I'm coming from, I mean, it's interesting listening to your path because there our paths are very different, but it, the similarity I hear is the convolutedness of it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like a lot of twists and turns. Mine is probably more twisty and turny than yours. Um, just because I started out not really having a million interests and not really knowing what I wanted to do. And I was doing human rights work in Guatemala, uh, or around Guatemala from U S side. Um, and then kind of realized that I was overwhelmed by the political Mm -hmm. and wanted to work on the personal and was also having my own kind of amazing art renaissance in my own life. And, um, so the two came together. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So it was pretty great. And then went to grad school, yada, yada, and then, you know, ended up creating, you know, and so now I have like kind of a dual life where I'm a therapist two days a week and I do mindful art studio three to 
five to seven days a week. Three to 80,000 days yeah, a week. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it, it's what, one thing that's just been sort of amazing to me is how, you know, it's, obviously it's different, right? Like what I'm doing, and we've talked about this, what I'm doing at Mindful Art Studio is not art therapy because art therapy happens in an office with a therapist. But there's this overlapping thing where all of us can use art for our own personal growth and healing. Mm -hmm. And that's something that drew me to art therapy in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I don't know. I mean, so I guess the big thing that art therapy school beyond just kind of clinical training and all that, but in terms of my art, the big thing that it taught me was to focus on the process and the idea of trusting the process and it being a practice instead of a Mm product-oriented practice. And I think it also helped me tap back into the elements of art making that had always, as a kid, felt very spiritual to me, but I wouldn't have had those words for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so when I look at your art and especially a lot of the figures and I just see it like there's a similarity to some of my art and I just the spirit of it feels very similar and I feel like I look at your art and I think yeah I can imagine having made my version of that and then I'd be dialoguing with the piece and she'd be giving me her wisdom and Mm. so I was just kind of curious to hear about your process and you know how is that as it I think it is a spiritual yeah. process for you and so I'd just love to hear about that and the ways in which it may be different from mine too. Um, well for me so I call my process fearless painting and um a lot of it is I I'm focused on both process and product and I think a lot of that has to do because my training is as an artist and not a therapist mm-hmm. and so I'm re- and also it has a lot to do with my training as an art historian too because mm-hmm. I have a real love for the lineage of where art comes from mm-hmm. and and how the creative process has evolved you know since caveman days yeah. and so I'm really interested in the vocabulary that art has and so um, there's kind of that connection to the actual product and the lineage of that as well as my own personal process. And painting is the one thing I've been doing since I've been as little as I can remember, you know? So for me, it's really, A, it's like I can't imagine my life without it ever because it's just so natural for me to, to, to paint. Um, and it really, it's spiritual in a sense because it's, it's kind of communicating with my, inner landscape always always that's okay I use that term too (laughs) yeah oh and so for example like last week I had to um work on something for my business and I hit a point where I couldn't quite I didn't know what to do so I actually I I I have something I call studio log it's just a little most game so I started writing I like kind of journaling some of that stuff out and then I came to this question and I was like you know, what do I do? What do I do? So I just pull out the paintbrush and I start painting. And actually what came was, um, a figure like of a woman, but through the process of the painting, it wasn't necessarily the woman that gave me the answers, but the answers I needed to come like to that question started to download because of my process. So that happens a lot of times. And then sometimes what happens is I can tell when things are going to shift in my own life by the shifts that are happening in my painting. So because I show up just about daily to this practice, it's like a check-in with myself. You know, I can check in. So in that way, it's spiritual. I'm not much of a, um, as I like to tell my students, I'm not much of a, a dog and pony kind of gal. Like I don't set up candles and stuff like that it's just showing up every day to this process and putting something on the paper Mm -hmm. that is the spiritual act for me like it grounds me and makes me a better person there's like some I'll I'll admit there's sometimes weeks that go by and I might not do it because I'm so um focused on getting a project done or something and I can I can literally feel the difference of how I'm showing up in the world and so I'll have to stop myself and be like I gotta paint I have to I have to paint and so for me the spiritual aspect of it is really that helping me be a be a more grounded nicer person in general 
you know, that's what I feel is, is, is an important aspect of the spiritual path. And, um, yeah, and, and it's just a beautiful, I mean, each of the paintings I have a relationship with in the sense, you know, then I, it'll finish and then I'm like, oh, you know, they, they'll, some of them will live with me in my studio or in our home. They're kind of like have their own little, you know, energy to them and we, I'll switch them around and stuff and, and they'll, they'll mean something, you know, over time as well. Yeah. So, you know, that's something funny that I didn't realize didn't happen naturally for other people. Like I'm constantly advocating that people hang up their own art and they always oh. say, really? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't you? First yeah. of all, it's free decoration, and I'm just cheap, so. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't yeah, know why, but it's also just, like, it inspires me to do more. When I see it, it's like, oh, art, yeah. Yeah, and for me, I hang it up, and then, like, I'll take art down, and I'll go back in my studio and, like, change new art, and it changes the energy of the room, mm -hmm. and it changes, you know, it, it's like moving your furniture around, you know, yeah. it kind of, like, refreshes things up. But also, there's something powerful, like, I will put certain paintings up because I know I need that certain energy. Also, mm -hmm. like I need to see it every day or I need to take that in every day. So um, that's part of it. Like I really believe there are sometimes when I paint, it's about actually putting a certain energy into that painting, like kind of transmitting something. So those paintings spend a lot of time in our home as well, like, mm -hmm. you know, infused in there. So, you know, there's paintings that represent – uh, you know, my move to Costa Rica, there's tons of paintings that represent my business or different programs. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, it was like those paintings behind me. Yeah. Uh, there's one really high up there, which represents my night program. The one in the middle represents um, Dirty Footprints, how she's evolving into yeah. going to Costa Rica. So like, I, that's how I communicate with even my programs. Like I can figure out, yeah. um, when it's time to shift because their essence kind of show up in my paintings as well. So. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. You know, that reminds me of something else I wanted to ask you about, which is the feminine, mm -hmm. right? You have that whole course and I'm just curious what, you know, that that's a big theme for you. And I wondered if you could talk about it. So, um, I have a course called Painting the Feminine, and it started in 2013. So in 2013, my husband was really sick. I had basically a one-year-old and a business, and uh, my husband was in and out of the hospital sometimes at months on end, and it was a really difficult time. And I actually, um, at that time, one of the things that kept me grounded and saved my life in a lot of ways was kundalini yoga mm -hmm. and i was doing kundalini yoga religiously i would go to a teacher and be like i don't care tell me to stand on one foot and put my arm out sideways and and repeat a word 50 times and i'll do it because it was the only thing that was really grounding me at, at this really hard time and one of the teacher one of my main teachers was really in kundalini yoga they have a whole lineage about the feminine feminine energy they call it women's teachings and I just became really interested in this idea of like feminine energy. And so I, in November of that year, I gave myself my own little challenge of showing up every day to, I don't, I don't have the, the book right here, but every day I showed up to my art journal and I took a different facet of what I consider feminine wisdom or feminine cool. energy and created a piece around it. And I just shared it on my blog. And what happened was so many people were really interested in it. So the following January, I created a, a, a workshop, an online workshop. And all it really is, is I tell stories of the fast, different facets of the feminine. So like vulnerability or intuition or um, stories of what it like. I spend a lot of time talking about the feminine goes into, you know, the underground, the darkness, the, the depths, like, what does that mean? And so we look at kind of the darker sides of what it means, the feminine. So it's not about painting women. Mm -hmm. It's not about painting girls or faces or anything. It's really about what is feminine wisdom? What is that feminine energy that, 
in our society is really either suppressed or not valued. Like, you know, and so it's really like, what, where's our strength in being vulnerable? Where's our strength in, in community? So community is a big part of it yeah. or sharing and all of these feminine kind of values or principles. So we take one each day and we paint. And what's so beautiful and amazing about this course is that I just kind of tell the story, but everyone comes and tells their story and then they have this visual story that unfolds as well. So by the end of the course, everyone has a body of work about what the feminine is to them. And it's just so delicious. It's so, um, it's such a powerful process. And it just came like we back to our conversation earlier. It came by following my heart and it came by giving myself what I needed. And, and then I was like, Oh, people like this. Let's, let's, let's make a course, you know, and it's been running ever since. And, um, every time there's more women excited to take it. So it really is. And, and what I feel to kind of go back, what we were talking earlier, Amy, is the thing about being an artist is that it's a slow process for ourselves. And it's a slow process when you're in business. Like, if you really think about where I am in my business now compared to I have been doing this all my life, it's mm-hmm. a slow process to to create from your heart. When we create from our heart, it's not like a rocket ship, you right. know. So um, to trust that and to be open and to, to be observed like, oh, people, they're really drawn to this. So this is what I want to feed my community right. and, and being able to listen to what they that, you know, they resonate with what your work is, too. Yeah, and I, I, I do know what you mean, uh, especially given, like, that process of finding fluid art, right? Like, I did a, um, I was doing a lot of small art. Like, I had been, it's funny, because when we talked, I had been trying to put together a way to teach, basically, like, these, I don't know what it was, like, five or six pillars that I felt and feel really help hold up my art practice right Mm -hmm. and it's things like carrying a portable art journal working small um doing things in series um just all these elements that help free me up because Uh then things become more accessible it's shorter it doesn't feel as overwhelming you improve your skills yeah Um, um but when i put it together it was very like didactic and not exciting like it was about the lessons instead of being about the process Mm -hmm. and when I took the time to just kind of sit back and say okay yeah I'm going to take the risk and not be doing 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 and I'm just going to focus on my art suddenly it kind of like that went into the background and I guess was percolating and then as I was working on what I normally do which was I had gotten into this process of all making all these little circles that I call mini masterpieces and doing Mm -hmm. all this like repetitive stuff and I realized like duh (laughs) you know it's right here (laughs) yeah yeah I think that's common with us as artists especially because it sounds to me when I listen to Amy that you have a real strong awareness of your process Mm -hmm. and the parts that put it together but then if we get too entwined in the cerebral part of it, it loses that energy Mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I can really see where your class then got the balance of it. So you needed to give yourself that art making time to. Yeah. I think that's a good observation for me that I can get caught up in the cerebral. (laughs) Yeah. And, and well, that's, but that's part of your greatness as an artist. I think that's, what's really important to, to realize so in my night group, I just actually, we were having a conversation about like, I call them lodestones, like kind of your principles or values that guide your business or your, your mission as an artist. And they asked me what is mine. And I said, well, I always want things to feel like an adventure. You know, I'm like, I always, that's, that's like number one. I always wanted to feel, and then I realized, I was like, wait, some of you might be like about to pee your pants thinking, oh my God, my business has to be like an adventure. I'm like, that's what works for me. Like I work when things are a little bit chaotic, when things are a little bit like when last minute, I'm really on top of it. And when I can just go from my own essence, I'm really, 
um, in my power. Mm -hmm. But for some people, they need a different um, sensibility, you know? And for some people, that it might be being more um, analytical. I have a, a student who's extremely analytical about things, and it's her greatness, you know? Like, she's going to reach people and resonate with people that I don't, you know? And right. so I think that's what's so beautiful is that being an artist has so many different flavors. It doesn't have to look or feel a certain way for you to be successful because there's so many artists that are very analytical or very cerebral or spend a lot of time inwardly thinking about things mm -hmm. and they need uh, an expression, a process of art too that res that they can feel comfortable in to, to give it through. And sometimes being with someone who's like, oh, it's got to be an adventure could be putting them way out of their comfort zone. Yeah. You know, and so it's such a beautiful thing to be that yeah, way. Yeah, it's really interesting just as I'm listening to you trying to, I, I want to think about that more because I have to put the pieces together because I have overlapping but different parts with you. Like I very much want my art process to feel like an adventure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know that I want, <laughs> the entrepreneur part, I'm not, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I would use the word adventure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, it is an adventure, but I don't think that would be like a pillar for me. So it's, it's kind yeah. of interesting thinking about like, yeah, where, where I want or, or where naturally the academic kind of cerebral part comes in for me versus the more adventurous free, free flowing. Cause one of the things I've noticed being in business is as opposed to my normal way, I'm very, I don't. I hate planning stuff out. <laughs> like if I have an idea for a class, then yeah, it's going to be really like one, two, three for the most part. And then I kind of go back and forth from the art and figure it out. But like, I, I like being inspired by what's on my plate that day and being like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I want to write about this or, um, and I think and, that's natural for, as an artist. We have to be in that communion with our creative process that way. Yeah. I think that's yeah. So it's interesting because I've tried, that's, I think that's my, one of my growing edges in creative business is trying to figure out how to make things planful enough, but also trust the process and anyway, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And that's a bit of being an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is just like the creative process in that sense. So I'm sure what you really resonate with the creative process can be applied to your practice as an entrepreneur. I, I, I thrive on taking a little bit of risks always, you know, like I'm always curious, like if I try this, like what's going to happen yeah. and then have to kind of like hustle a little bit. I, yeah. it's just part of my nature. Yeah. I mean, it's come to, it was showing when I was, you know, in my twenties, didn't like a job and I would quit and then I would be like, okay, now I have, you know, rent and cars and this, like I got to figure out. And then it was something lively would come out of that mm -hmm. aspect of being kind of, so it's it's really embedded. For you. It's it's not a surprise that I do that still in the way I work because it's always been a part of my constitution, you know. Yeah. So it's really getting a sense of what your your sensibilities are and then applying that as your greatness. Yeah. What you, you know. I love that, and I wonder how you would um, like. Can, can you translate translate that for people like, you know, folks who are you know most of the people who come to me are. Like, I feel blocked, my inner critic is in the way, I can't seem to get started. And, you know, what would be your best advice for people who are looking to tap into something really authentic in their art, but also being able to just let go, give into the process and not be so, I don't know any other word, but word except for just getting worried and getting caught up in all those art fears that then get in the way of you making anything in the first place. Yeah. Well, I think it takes a bit of discipline and it takes a bit of commitment. Like if you're really feeling the call, like I want to be an artist and it sounds like the people that come to you have that desire, but there's this big lump of fear in front of them. So then it starts with saying, okay, 10 minutes a day, yeah. 10 minutes a day where I'm going to play with color or I'm going to, you know, scribble, or I'm going to just do a little something in a tiny, you know, move watercolor around. And your work is so beautiful to that fluidity, you know, of just moving. It's not like I'm going to sit down and do a, a three-point perspective drawing, you know. And so it's, it has that. And 
I think it's Stephen Pressfield that says, you know, I don't know who said it, something about you just, you know, the muse, you just have to show up. And then the muse decides to show up. It's like, we can't mind it or trick it or yeah. for, for, like I, I've this year I've committed to um, working out with a trainer. Mm. Today's the best example where I'm like, I hate it. I don't want to go. Blah, 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 blah. Like every excuse went in my head and like every ounce of my energy took to just get myself in that yeah. gym. Yeah. And it, in 10 minutes, I'm like, okay, I love this. Now yeah. I remember why I'm here, you know, yeah. and the same thing goes for art and we will totally, you know, it's part of our human nature for some reason. We will totally talk ourselves out of it. Yeah. But once we're in it, we can do it. And then, it becomes like a lot of that fear of like, Oh, it's not right. It's not this is really not fear as much as it's ignorance to our own process. And so when people are starting out, they don't know, they don't have a vocabulary or language or anything to, um, to, um, direct themselves with because they haven't had enough relationship with their creative practice. Mm -hmm. So they don't know. So it's like dating somebody brand new and they do something and you have nothing to go like, you know, what, what's happening right. here. And so when you get to know your creative process and the only way you know that is by going in day after day, you know, yeah. and when you start to know it, then you can realize, Oh, you know, I, I do things this way or I'm getting better at this. Or, yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's part of why I always recommend that people work in a series because it kind of undoes that idea of any one thing needing to meet some particular standard Mm -hmm. and it also creates the idea of you need to produce a lot (laughs) you gotta practice yeah you have to practice and then I think series I I'm also a big series person I call it like create a body of work Mm -hmm. you know and I think what's so beautiful about that as well is that you can learn so much. You start to see um, your own visual language. You get a sense of what your mark is. You get a sense of how you apply the paint. You get a sense. And those things, you know, it doesn't matter if you just started a week ago or 10 years ago. You already have a sensibility to how you paint or how you put your mark down. And that's what's so exciting to me. I think it's super exciting to go like, wow, nobody else does it. Exactly you know, like but that. I couldn't yeah. do what you do, Amy. I couldn't make those little things look that way if I tried, right? It's always well, going to come out. I think you probably went. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and say what everybody else, it's always going to come out their way. Slightly and different, so yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I love that too. And I think one of the things that people start to realize as they take any of these classes, whether it's in person or online or whatever, but, um, you know, is, is like, oh, that's what my look is, right? Like that's what my marks look like. And that's the way I say something. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it's so much easier. Like I took a class recently, I did a a wonderful workshop and the woman next to me, we were in printmaking and she had never done um, stamp cutting actually specifically. And her stamps all had a style, like immediately off the bat, it was so clear and she couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. But everybody else could see it. It was Mm -hmm. so interesting to me. And it was a good reminder of like how, with what you're saying, how blind we can be in the beginning to like what is okay, like the range of what is okay. Because I think we have such strange ideas about what art is in our culture. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this thing where you have to have a degree and you have to this and you have to that. Um, And and I often find that if I have people pretend that they are looking at someone else's art, it opens up a whole new perspective on what they're seeing because it's not coming through this lens of, oh, I made that. Mm-hmm. It's like there's more legitimacy almost if it's somebody else's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, our culture puts a lot of stress and emphasis on value, that there needs to be a value to anything we do. Yeah. You know, so oh, that's a good I point. Think- a lot of adults especially come to art later in life and feel like they've already been immersed in society enough to be like, well, what's the value? Am I wasting money? All of those things start to challenge their self-worth around why they're creating. I think that's a really good point. You know? And so I think a lot of the fear they're feeling is really just this struggle with, you know, is it worthy? Am I, you know, all of that as much. And so um, what you what you give to people, especially, you know, this make it small, make it simple, make it, you know, all of this, 
can be such a great introduction because they get their toes wet and they um, get comfortable with it and then they can start to see how they can deepen and start to get a path for it but they don't have to invest and you know face all that like is it really worth it or go buy yeah. huge you know easels and this and that and so and that's what's beautiful about art journaling as well yeah. you can start to kind of get your toes so it's really complicated I, I always say when people feel that fear or that resistance that it's not necessarily a bad thing but sometimes that resistance is there to to guide you in a way and maybe you know taking baby steps is important we can't mm -hmm. just beat it over or knock it off it's there for a reason as well mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so you did that beautifully amy likewise thank <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh, this has been so fun yeah thank you so much Thank you so wonderful. much. I mean, I yeah. wonder, is there anything else that you um, want to make sure that you talk about or let folks know about or any other last thoughts on our conversation? Um, hmm. You know, right. 21 Secrets is, is on sale again now, right? Yeah, 21 Secrets. The, it's the last and final edition. It comes out on um, Monday, October 30th. I don't know. If this airs before or after that, um, I'm gonna try. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. And uh, it's it's called tell your Se tell your secrets, tell your story. <laughs> and there's 21 artists, myself included, that are giving little workshops to get them all at once, and uh, just to help us find different ways to tell different facets of our life story through through art, through painting and collage and visual mixed media so um it's a really juicy really juicy juicy uh, really edition is. and it's yeah. like you're the 21 secrets especially is such a great value like it's, yeah it's kind of insane how much you give for yeah <laughs> and it's the last one there's going to be no more 21 secrets yeah. so time to get it before it it's it is time to get it yeah yeah so thank you thanks connie so much for being here i really appreciate it